Good day, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. Going to have a crack at a video about the the topic which is known by various titles in different disciplines. The warriorists and the militarists, they call it military intelligence. The psychiatrists call it paranoid ideation. And it sort of runs like this. Well, if that's what they're going to do, then what I'll do is. Okay, now, the classical civilian explanation that I like to give of this one is the person who suffers from paranoid ideation looks out their window across the street, they see their neighbour get out of the car carrying a brand new shiny 0.177 of an inch caliber air rifle. Now, inside the neighbor's head, what they want to do is teach their kid to shoot against paper targets in the backyard. The individual across the road suffering from paranoid ideation looks at the weapon, fixates on the weapon, considers the fact that that weapon is dangerous out to hundreds of meters. Little tiny pellet might fall down out of the sky, might hit you in the eye, might send you blind. So I think, gee, if if they took it into their head, they could they could shoot at me with that thing. They could they could make ping ping noises on my roof. They could they could maybe break a window with it. They could hit me in the eye and blind me. Oh lordy lordy, I better go and defend myself against that. I'll go down to the gun shop and I'll buy. Let's see, a 22 caliber rimfire. And that'll be dangerous at a mile. So I'll be able to shoot them before they can shoot me, and I'll have a bigger gun. So that happens. And let's say that the person who lives beside the bloke who bought the 0.177 caliber air rifle, let's say they suffer from paranoid ideation as well, and they see the bloke with his brand new 22 caliber bolt action rimfire rifle going into his house, and they think along all those same lines, only they come up with the figure of dangerous at a mile, 22 caliber long rifle ammunition. So they decide that to defend themselves, what they really should do is go down to the gun shop and buy himself something centerfire, something around a third of an inch in diameter. And they don't want to spend too much money on it, so they come home with either a five-round bolt-action second or third-hand hunting rifle or a military surplus people gun. So there'd be three guns in three houses and one of them was bought for shooting at paper targets, and two of them have been bought to defend themselves in case anybody else with a gun decides to run amok. That's called paranoid ideation. Well, if they're going to do, then what I'll do is... On a larger scale you get one nation sees another nation decide that they're troubled by too many unemployed young men between the ages of puberty and marriage who need to be kept off the streets and give them something to do and a sense of group unity and, and a common goal and a purpose and teach them to give orders and take orders and you know occasionally face a bit of danger perhaps so they can script them all all the unemployed young fellows from I don't know, 18 to 35, put them all in the army and make them march up and down in neat straight rows. Just for something to do, to give the economy a bit of a boost, because if the government spends money on things like uniforms and boots and rations and stuff, well, that'll, that'll cause churn in the economy and there's a multiplier factor. However, the neighbours on the other side of the national border, they look at this and say, Oi, look, over there, they're, they're putting all their young fellas in the army. What if they was to get their big army and bring them over here and want to take away all of our lovely stuff? We better put our fellows in the army too. 
And that's when the, the generals in country number A, they look at the country B and they say, oh, gee, they're, they're, they're putting all their young fellas in the army and all our guns are really bloody old and crappy. You know, we need to get new guns for these fellas we've just taught to march up and down in neat straight lines. And off you go, you've got a bloody arms race going on all because one of the countries had a problem with unemployment. That's perhaps the most charitable explanation or the most charitable slant you can put onto it. It might indeed be that the constipated megalomaniac in charge of both countries wants to have a bigger military farce so that they can threaten to or actually roll across the border in a blitzkrieg land-grabbing campaign. Some of them do it. Then they run into the karmic feedback loops within the cosmic scoreboard effect that mean that selfishness never actually works out in the long run. And if it's murderous bloody selfishness, it works out really, really badly for the people who instigate it. Once you under can stumble that that is in fact a fundamental principle of the sc cosmic scoreboard effect or the universe or the God theory, or whatever you want to call the unseen, unwritten rule book, which more or less explains what happens when you sit it back on your ass for 30 or 40 years and watch it unfold and notice what turns out well and what turns out badly. You can come to the conclusion that if you see somebody practicing martial arts all morning and, and practicing shooting all afternoon and, and constantly thinking about what they would do if they were attacked and how they could go about defeating this, that or the other attack. You watch them walking around, looking at everything, wondering whether it's going to jump out and try and kill them and, and what they would do if it did. And you see that they live a thoroughly fucking miserable and terrified life. They spend vast quantities of time and energy and money on preparing themselves for an attack that they hope never appears. They get to be the sort of person who happily takes a job as a guard at a bank where they spend all day waiting for something to happen that never actually turns up and then they go home at the end of the day feeling like because they get paid for the stress that they underwent they've, they've had a productive day and they've been good for society. It's a sinecure, it's something to do with a person that would otherwise be bloody dangerous walking around for 80 hours a day with nothing else to occupy their mind. But on that very example, bank guards. Town I grew up in, been there since 1850 sort of thing. Never been a bank robbery. Nobody's ever walked into a bank and produced a weapon and, and threatened the tellers. But such things do happen occasionally somewhere, and the way this paranoid ideation works is that if you become aware of an incident occurring, a one-off rare unusual occurrence, the person who suffers from paranoid ideation, they consider that and they ponder it and they fixate over it and they worry about what would they do if it happened to them. So the bank teller's union pressured one of the banks in town said to them, what you have to do is erect perspex screens over the top of the heritage listed bank counters, which have never been robbed, so that if somebody comes in with a gun and tries to hold the place up, they won't be able to jump over the top of the counters and, and lay hands on the staff. Because that's what somebody did once upon a time somewhere else, you know, and maybe we saw it in a movie that was made in Hollywood, but you know, it's what it's what we're worried about, see? And the people who suffer from the paranoid ideation, which extends you know, to politicians who legislate and lay down rules and conditions, it was decided that the only way that bank could operate in the absence of these perspex shields to stop the bank robbers that have never been here in, in 150 years, to stop them from jumping over the counter, was to employ a security guard out the front of the bank to look up and down the street and dissuade the non-existent bank robbers from making an appearance. The security guard came from a local security 
company, insecurity company, I suppose you'd be better to call them because that's what they do. They prey on people's insecurities. They reassure them that if you pay them, they will try to stop something that's highly unlikely to happen anyway. And they leave little pieces of paper stuffed under the door various times during the night to prove that they showed up to have a look and make sure that nothing had happened just like it never does. The insecurity industry. And the insecurity guard would stand there at the front of the bank and for the time it took before the bank managed to locate different premises at the other end of the street, more modern premises in the renovated building where there was no barrier to them installing barriers between the tellers and the customers. Yeah, they had six months or so, a security guard standing there and at the end of the time, they declared the project to be a success because during the time the security guard had been paid to stand out the front of the bank during opening hours, there had been no bank robberies. Not only in that bank, but in all the banks in the main street, just like there'd been no bank robberies for the previous 150 years. So they reduced a total of zero to zero and claimed it to be a success. But that's how your people who suffer from paranoid ideation think about the world. Now, in case anybody quibbles with the point that I'm throwing the word paranoia and paranoid into the conversation, you know, like other people put salt on their potatoes, lest it be thought that I don't know what the word means, I'm going to relate a little bit of a story once upon a time. There was a domestic dispute going on among some people with, which, with whom I had been fairly well acquainted for a while. And one of the parents asked me if I would give evidence as to how off the planet their ex-partner was and I thought about it and yeah all right so I wrote an affidavit and I swore out the affidavit and in the affidavit squeaking from my pillar of authority of having sat a month's worth of lectures in psychiatry and psychology and got a hundred percent in the written exam at the end as a general nurse I hazarded the opinion that this particular parent who was disputing custody was paranoid and to further develop the segue this was because when I asked him his name after I'd known him for a while you know six months on site kind of thing and I just sold him a, a utility load of empty tin cans for a dollar each invited me back to his place for coffee and we're sitting there and, and you know I didn't actually know what his name was he was just you know the bloke who bought the tin cans and uh, I asked him what his name was and he looked at me and, and he looked left and right and he, he went outside and he looked and he scanned the whole horizon and he told me what his name was and I said, oh, what have you got warrants out after you or something like that, have you? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. He said he was hiding from the Irish Republican Army. Okay, well, I didn't discount that as being the work of a complete nutcase because I have previously met a bloke who was a student nurse who used to practice Tai Chi on the basketball court and he said that he'd had to come to Australia because he was a commando with the British Army and he, his name appeared on a death list and therefore they re relocated him at the other end of the world. And we thought that was total big note and bullshit, you know, like he was a skinny little bugger. He was wiry. And he was strong, but he was a skinny little bugger. He wasn't any Arnold Schwarzenegger in him. One night in the, in the Concord RSL, he managed to turn around from the bar with a couple of handfuls of, of full beers and a Maori managed to get up and turn from the table. And he had beers as well. And the both of them bumped in and they both spilt some beers. And this Maori was a head and a half taller than the Pommy. And the Maori roared and went at him and then the... All that Taekwondo stuff, or no, the, the Thai tree that he used to practice on the basketball court, that all speeded up about a hundred, a factor of a hundred, and, and the, the Thai tree become Taekwondo or Judo or Jiu-Jitsu or something. And this Maori was flat out unconscious before any of us had really registered more than a blur of movement out of the pommy. And the pommy goes to turn back to the bar to get new beers. And two more Maori stood up from the table, which left only one Maori sitting down at the table. And they come up to him and there was more blurry pommy movement. And there was then a pile of three Maoris lying down there on the floor. And the pommy just went to the bar and got his 
beers and come back to the table. And, and all of our student nurses looked at him in a whole new light ever afterwards. Because if he could swing himself like that and take out three Maoris without raising a sweat, then maybe he was a time expired commando from the British Army. And if he wanted to say that he'd been moved to Australia because the IRA were going to kill him if he stayed in Northern Ireland, okay, I have no reason to believe it was bullshit. But this fellow who was down on the hippie commune after buying a truckload of empty tin cans, he didn't sound to me like he'd been in the British Army. And I asked him, what, you know, you were part of occupation forces in Northern Ireland, were you? Oh, no, 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 no. He was worried because of something that his mother's grandfather had done. Or was it his... You know, I'm pretty sure it was his mother's grandfather and somehow, even through the woman taking the man's name, he reckoned that the IRA was still so pissed off with his great-grandfather that they were going to come out here to Australia and assassinate him living in a tent on a commune after having been kicked out of the National Park with a missus and a couple of kids. So that's why I thought he was paranoid, and that's why I'd said that he was paranoid in the affidavit, and I was prepared to stand up in court and tell that story if I had to, to defend it. And the barrister in Sydney says to me, so how would you define paranoia if you were in the, doc in the witness box under oath? And I smart assedly said, well, who says I'm paranoid and why do they want to know? And the barrister said, that won't fly in court. I need you to give me a, a, a definition that if the opposition looks it up in the medical dictionary, you're going to have told me the right thing. So, you know, you better check your facts. So I did. I rang up the uh, charge nurse of the psychiatric ward at the hospital where I had trained and I explained the situation and the charge nurse of the psych ward said, Jesus, you want a, a definition of paranoia that's going to stand up in a court of law? Hold the phone while I go and get the bloody the dicks book, the, the dictionary textbook of psychiatric terms. So he comes back and he says, paranoia is a psychiatric medical condition. Right, fairly obvious, comprising or featuring or characterized by delusions of grandeur, ideas of reference, persecution fantasies, and a generalized lack of logical thought. So I wasn't wrong when I said that the Fruit Loop who was worried about the IRA coming to kill him because of something his great-grandfather did in Ireland when Queen Victoria was on the throne. Yeah, he was paranoid. But I didn't actually know what the correct terminology was until that moment of embarrassment when the, or the barrister put me on the spot. As it happened, the parent whose case I was supporting managed to subpoena the other parents' psychiatric records from a time that they had been voluntarily behind the lunatic bars and disclosures which were made to the court from the psychiatric records were so devastating to that parent's case that the house of cards folded and, and neither I nor any of, of the other witnesses who'd travelled to Sydney and stayed in a motel for a week you know, and turned up at court every day to sort of psych out the other team's legal, legal, beagle and brief facts. None of us had to actually get up in court and tell our versions of the story. But that's one thing I did learn from the entire episode is I learnt the dictionary definition of paranoia and I can't see that there's any features which distinguish paranoid ideation which should get you locked up and medicated from what the warriorists call military intelligence. Far as I can see, everybody in the excited status of Norte armed Americano who's purchased themselves a firearm because of the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 pandemic. I don't know whether they want to shoot the virus or they want to shoot people who might be likely to cough on them, but they are suffering from paranoid ideation.
and they're spending considerable chunks of their money and their resources and their time preparing to have a gunfight over a freaking virus. Paranoid ideation. Orthodox doctrinaire military inter intelligence. Oh, you know, well, we, we live in a country where anybody's allowed to have a gun. There's all kinds of people who are a bit crazy in the head who might have a gun, and if they come up my driveway, I want to be able to shoot at them. If they've got a gun and you shoot at them and you miss, you've just guaranteed they're going to try and shoot at you. If you think they've got a gun, the idea is not to fucking annoy them, you dickhead. Because then they might go away and then they'll annoy somebody else because what they want to do is prove how tough they are. That's why they've got a gun, so they can hide behind the little hole in the muzzle that the bullet comes out of. That little hole, that little circular void, that becomes their target. And target is a, a Gaelic Scottish word, but perhaps it's pronounced Tarje, you know, but target. It's, it's a small circular punching shield that you wear on your left forearm when you're fighting with swords. Quite useful when you're fighting with swords, but at a place called Culloden in 1748, the British Army had previously spent weeks practicing to shoot at small concentric circular aiming points. And they were drilled, aim at the target, aim at the target. Because if someone's running at you with a sword in their right hand and they've got one of these concentric circular things on their left forearm, you aim at the target. If you hit the target, you're going to break their bloody arm. They're not going to be much danger on a battlefield if they've got a broken arm in one hand dangling down and a, and a sword in the other hand. And they're going to be in a lot of pain and they're not going to be highly effective as a soldier. So they had another trick to do with the spacing of them standing side by side so they could use the bayonet on the end of their musket after they'd fired a shot to not fight with the sword of the Scotsman who was directly in front. Instead, when the bloke who was coming to hack his mate up, the swordsman would raise his arm and when he raised his arm, boom, you can stick your bloody bayonet up into his raised armpit. So there was a bit of teamwork involved. And that's when the British Army took to the idea of training people to shoot against circular aiming points and calling the aiming point the target was because it won the Battle of Culloden that way. So it's kind of ironic that the little circular hole in the end of a person's firearm, if they're keeping that firearm for defensive purposes, that little circular shield has to be kept between all of the vital meat. You know, they've got their brain, they got one lung and a heart and maybe half a liver and a bit of a spleen and a kidney. Got to have a kidney. They have to protect that much of, of their physical integrity, their anatomy and physiology in order to hope to survive the gunfight. So they try to hide a cubic foot of vital meat behind, I don't know, a quarter or a third of a square inch of muzzle area. So they, they, they have to get that little muzzle between them and anything that they imagine might be dangerous. All of this paranoid ideation and stress sends them further and further and further down the paranoid delusion that the world is a dangerous place where everything's out to kill them. The people who habitually carry a firearm for self-defense get into the point where as they walk around, it's as if they've got gun sight graticules hanging in front of their eye. And whatever they see, they calculate the windage, the range, and the bullet drop, and if necessary, the amount of deflection they would need to apply to a shot in order to hit that thing that they can see, all the way out to the limit of their visibility with whatever firearm they happen to have on them. And then they realize that anybody else who's got a gun might be doing that to them. And if you really want to fucking annoy the shit out of somebody who habitually carries a gun, just keep an eye out, and every time you see them, tip your forehead to them. And the chances are that by the time they see you, you will have already touched your forehead and waved, so you're pointing roughly in their general direction with your forefinger, 
Where you going? Where you going? Where you going? If you apply this method, for example, to a police officer who has previously arrested you, you can start out just being friendly, you know, like no hard feelings or yeah, I was acting like a dickhead, you know, how you going, you know, you having a good day these days, you know, you catching any. And after six months, you'll notice that that particular cop, every time they see you, they flinch. Because they're processing this not through the, you know, okay, there's one that we actually caught while he was on the wrong track and stomped on his head and turned him around and put him back with the rest of the herd. And he's not going to bloody do that again because, you know, we learned him, eh? No, no, no. What they see is you've already seen them and waved to them before they've seen you. So if you had a gun, if you wanted to, then you could have shot them before they saw you. And that works in their little mind. And after another six to 18 months, they transfer out of town. It's an absolutely reliably observed phenomenon. Not many people know about it, but I've inadvertently conducted the experiment a few times. And when you think back on it and you process it all, it's fucking hilarious. All I was trying to do was be friendly. Yet they were genuinely flinching every time they saw me waving to them. So that's a little bit of a monologue on the topic of paranoid ideation. Well, if that's what they're going to do, then what I'll do is. A lot of people say to me, what would you do if the bloody Indonesian army come up your driveway? And my honest answer is I'd ask them whether they want tea or coffee to drink. Because I've got a, two bows and about six arrows between them. And if I was to go out there and hide behind a tree and put an arrow anywhere near any occupation army coming into Australia, even if I got wildly lucky and, and, and managed to hit somebody and do serious damage to them, it would only slow them down for long enough to call in a fucking airstrike on me and my little humpy. If I leave the bow hanging up on the wall covered in cobwebs and they come up here and they have a look around the place and they see the fucking bow covered in cobwebs, you can't fake that. They decide that he's a lunatic and he's harmless and we'll fucking leave him up there with his solar panels. He's got no military value at all. And the people who suffer from paranoid ideation, the people who worship military intelligence, they kind of get a bit nonplussed by that. It's like, oh, this doesn't process. I've spent my whole life worrying about what might need to be defended against next because you never know what's going to kill you because it's a hostile universe because, 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 because that's what the pulp fiction in the popular press since the fucking printing press was invented has been selling exciting stories that you can pump out place advertising into what proportion of the industrial economy of the global vile age is devoted to making movies glorifying fucking violence video games glorifying violence because in time of war you're allowed to run around and kill the enemy and it's supposed to be really great fun to kill the enemy. That's why everybody's allowed to play violent fucking video games. Circular logic, pseudo logic. Rings of psychiatric tension inside their own, their own brain. It's, it's paranoid ideation. A powerfully destructive force of stupidity. Anyway, been wanting to get that one off my chest for a while because we're what, two weeks out from the, the great disputed election in the excited status of Nort Day Armed Matacano. Trumpy's got all of his supporters and base gingered up to think that the election's going to be rigged because it looks like he's going to lose. Apparently, for at least 
two years, it's been really difficult to buy ammunition in a gun shop in America because as soon as a truckload of ammunition comes in the back door of the shop, it marches straight out the front door. It doesn't sit on the shelves. No gun shop's been able to keep a stock of ammunition. The factories haven't stopped producing it. The customers have just started buying it. Since COVID, there's been a sort of 30 to 60% downturn in the number of people going to shooting ranges because people are scared of moving together in groups, or they used to be until just the last fortnight or so of the campaign. So there's actually been a downturn in the num number of people shooting. And most Americans don't actually live anywhere where they can shoot a gun in their backyard or walk out and hunt a rabbit for breakfast. They, they, they live in cities. They want to shoot, they go to a shooting range. So the amount of ammunition being consumed has fallen. The amount of ammunition being purchased has risen. There's said to be at least one firearm for every citizen in the excited status of America, plus one for every resident. There's 320 million of them. It means 320 million firearms within the civilian population. But only 25% of Americans have a gun. So each one that's got one has actually got about four. Or maybe if there's one person who's only got one, there's somebody else who's got seven. Um, that, that could be how it works. And all of these people, they're arming themselves against the possibility of needing to defend themselves. And, and who do you want to defend yourself against? It boils down to if it's not the next door neighbor, it's the person from two streets away. Why do you think you're going to need to defend yourself against the people in your local community? Oh, well, you know, like post-apocalyptic zombie rationalization, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. When the shit hits the fan and the grid falls down, I need to have a, a cupboard full of guns and a basement full of ammunition to defend three tins of baked beans in the pantry. What's a zombie? Anybody who wants to steal your food. Where does this ideology come from? 1950s doomsday atomic war scenarios. Who crafted this fantasy and pumped it into the American psyche? Professional entertainers. People who wanted to be paid for their skill pretending to be somebody else in front of a camera telling a story about some fucking bullshit that never happened anyway. Or if something almost like that happened once upon a time, the story's been tweaked by the script writers into an almost unrecognizable caricature of what actually happened. But it's resulted in 320 million people who believe that kill them dead or win a medal every bloody time. Kill them dead or win a medal every bloody time. Anybody who serves in the American military is a fucking hero. I was in a discussion on a comment thread the other day. I saw somebody had said, oh, yeah, but you know, like, by your definition, that would make Adolf Hitler a war hero. And I thought, well... He fought through the First World War for four years. He was a, a regimental runner carrying messengers. They, they gave him a, a, a fucking medal for bravery. Under fire, he got wounded and he got gassed. And, you know, why would anybody who believes that every U.S. military serving person is a hero, why would they quibble about the idea that Adolf Hitler was a fucking war hero? Even if you look at his record in the Second World War, he pulled off the most difficult mission that anybody in any of the Allied forces never succeeded in. He shot Hitler. Nobody else could say that within the Grand Alliance. He shot Hitler in the Second World War, and in the First World War, he got a medal for bravery. He was obviously a war hero. <sighs> Paranoid ideation. And it only really causes the reactors, the people who don't think. The people who think about shit, they back off. People who, people who react reflexively, they've been through the 
modeled scenario in their mind or on the video game so many times you know if i see somebody reaching for their gun then i got to pull my gun out and i got to shoot them before they can draw a bead on me and that sort of shit's how you get detectives ganging up in bunches of six to shoot a fucking nigerian diplomat in an elevator lobby waiting to pull his mobile phone out of his pocket oh look he's got a lump under his coat he's He's black and we're white and we're cops and, you know, like, oh, he's reaching for his gun, quick. Six cops open fire and kill the poor bastard because he wanted to make a mobile phone call. Paranoid ideation. By the look of the Black Lives Matter movement, pretty much all the black fellows in America are shit scared of every fucking cop, especially the white ones. All the cops are terrified of all the friggin' civilians because they know how many guns are out there. And cops are like ambulance workers. They work with the fucking traumatised shit and the filth of society. Everything that fucks up, they get to see it. So in the cops' mind, that's what the citizens are. They're somebody who just hasn't pulled their gun out to try and shoot you yet. Paranoid ideation. I have no idea what option there is that is likely to lead to a peaceful election where everybody in the excited status understands and respects the results and whoever wins the election fairly takes over for the next four years of their prissy duncy and i think the idea of having the incumbent president remain in administrative command until january the 20th after losing an election if that's what happens on the 3rd of november that is absolute total fucking insanity. It might have worked out back in the days when the electric telegraph had yet to be invented, when you had to dispatch riders on horses to carry messages. And it might have been okay back then because everybody understood how government worked. But these days, with 40% of America getting their running orders from Rupert Murdoch, and Fox Entertainment. And just got to mention Rupert Murdoch and what he's done to the fucking poor, long-suffering Americans. Once upon a time, in the excited status, there was a congressional requirement which stated that any news or editorial material which was carried or broadcast across state lines, so that worked for newspapers, it worked for radios, it worked for television, news and editorial material had to be able to be proved true by the best known science of that time. So it was literally a federal offence to tell a lie in news and editorial material. So a bloke called Rupert Murdoch found that he couldn't buy more than 70% of the media in Australia. Back at the time, he couldn't buy more than 50, but you know, since then he's been able to um, successfully lobby liberal national governments to change shit so he now got 70 percent he tried in britain and got spat out by the british system he went to america and he, he, he bumped up against the limit of how much a non-citizen was allowed to buy in terms of media ownership and at the same time that he commenced proceedings to renounce his australian citizenship he commenced to lobby the US presidency to repeal this congressional requirement to tell the truth. And it wasn't long after he got his American citizenship that Ronald Reagan accepted the idea that to require corporations to tell the truth in their news and their editorial material was an unconstitutional constraint on the corporation's constitutional right to freedom of speech. Because in US law, there is no distinction made between a corporation as a corporate citizen and an individual made out of meat. So because a human in America is allowed to say anything, as long as they're not actually inciting somebody to break the law, corporations were entitled to say anything they bloody like. And that was when Rush Limbaugh and Alex Jones moved from being tin pot nutcases 
working on local radio stations that didn't go out past the state boundary to a national phenomenon aimed at white men who didn't go to school and the sort of women who shack up with them. And the reason apparently why Rupert Murdoch wanted to do that was because it's much, much, much cheaper to produce exciting, inflammatory ad propaganda as entertainment because all you have to do is have a couple of talking heads in a studio and a camera on them and they can talk any kind of rabid bullshit that comes into their mind. You don't have to actually employ reporters to go and do fact checking and check out the story. So that's why Fox Entertainment Proprietary Limited has an alleged news feed, but it's it's not it's not actually a news gathering organisation. It's a money making corporation. Makes money because the more exciting the content is, the more enraging, the more it gets your adrenaline squirting. The less likely people are to turn off it, the more money you can charge to advertisers. And the advertisers really don't want anybody burdening the audience with anything to think about beyond what they're going to buy next. So telling them that global warming is a Democrat hoax or that coronavirus is a Democrat hoax or telling them that America is in the best condition that it's ever been in or telling them that they need to abandon all environmental protection legislation because that's just green tape that makes it difficult to get a profit-making corporation up. That's all very well for the interest of the people who own the shares in the corporations who are going to benefit from the cash flow. It's absolutely shit house for the rest of the world. And you know, like Rupert Murdoch back in 1970, I don't know how many newspapers he owned, one or two in Australia perhaps. In the 50 years since 1970, 64% of all the wildlife, animals, fish, birds, insects, 64% of the, the animal wildlife on earth has died. And the more industrialized your nation is, the worse it is. In Britain, 68% of the wildlife's died. 94% of all the wild birds are dead over the past 50 years in Britain. The numbers of robins, the numbers of wrens, the numbers of crows, the numbers of rooks, the numbers of owls, the numbers of falcons. 94% of the birds dead because people like Rupert Murdoch want to continue to pressure the mass population to buy more stuff. Just keep on working and keep on buying more stuff. Compete against each other for jobs so we can push the wages down and push the profit margins up. Buy more stuff. You need more shiny, bright fucking landfill right now. Otherwise, you will miss out. And fear of missing out. What's it driven by? Fear. What's fear? Paranoia. Paranoid ideation. If you don't go and fucking trash the commons right now, while you're at home asleep, your next door neighbour will be out there cutting down the last tree. Look at Easter Island. They'd already cut down the last tree 60 years before Captain Cook showed up. Why do they want to cut down the last tree? Because they were having a war. Paranoid ideation. You know what war is? If you can actually spell it's W triple a w g h bracket exclamation mark close bracket right it's Wah! what it is it's a vocalization that's made by every species of primate and we humans are primates they make that vocalization vocalization anytime they are angry enough scared enough or hungry enough that they are prepared to kill members of their own species. Look at how the law applies to humanity. Normal times, you're not allowed to say something that anybody else perceives as a threat because that is a verbal assault. But in times of war, you can sneak up behind them and shoot them in the back while they're picking their nose and then fuck off before their mates notice. And you know what? 
If you do that five times while flying an aeroplane, they're going to call you an ace fighter pilot. Sneak up behind a stranger, shoot him in the back while he's picking his nose and fuck off before his mates catch up with you. Five times and you're an ace. In times of war! Because you're scared. So scared you're prepared to kill a member of your, your own species. What for, how come and why? Paranoid ideation. Well, if they're going to, then what I'm going to do is... Paranoid ideation. It's enough to give diarrhea the shits. And it's got most of the rest of the 8 billion by the frontal lobes. And it's driving them to compete in a rat race of fucking corporate lemmings seeing who can be the first one to run over the cliff. I don't know what they're planning on doing after they run over the cliff, whether they want to fucking evolve wings and fly away before they hit the ocean, or whether they're going to evolve fins and wings, uh, fins and gills, and swim their way out of it. All driven by paranoid ideation. It's been going on for 12,300 years since the death cult began at, at Gobekli Tepe, when the idea was to harvest everything so you could feed the stonemasons. And then they found there was nothing to harvest, so they had to plant hybrid strains of grain that was really good at living at Gobekli Tepe, where, which is where the stonemasons wanted to build their temple. And then, when they'd created a fucking desert, took them 700 years, then the diaspora from Gobekli Tepe took the idea of harvest everythingism and they carried it to the four winds. And if you have a look at a Google Earth map or a satellite photo with all the clouds removed, you can see in the southeastern corner of Turkey where Gobekli Tepe was, that is where the absolute bare, denuded, deforested, bald rock and dirt has been exposed the longest and the firstest. And as civilization has moved west and east, it's girdled the bloody world. And the idea of the death cult at Gobekli Tepe when they went on their di diaspora was that you have to have the biggest population that you can breed up on the land that you're living on so that you can have enough young men between the ages of puberty and marriage that you can train them in fighting so that when you turn your land into a desert, as you move onto somebody else's land where they've still got un unruined resources because their ancestors have done a better job of looking after their homeland than your ancestors did back at Gobekli Tepe where they fucked it, turned it into a desert. If you've got more angry, hungry, scared, young men between the ages of puberty and marriage than they've got, then you will be able to kill them all and take all their stuff. And if you don't have a bigger army, what do we use armies for? To stop your handies from falling on the ground. If you don't have a bigger army than the neighbouring tribe, then they might come and take your stuff. So quick, breed up, be become a plague of human fucking locusts. Turn the land you're living on into a desert so that you can have enough cities ends to pay the taxes to finance the army so that you can be prepared to go and steal somebody else's stuff. Paranoid ideation. What a crock of shit. And as the final part of the lesson, how do we know that all war is always all bullshit? Hmm? I'll tell you how we know. Because 20 years after they stopped shooting at each other, the individual service personnel from opposing sides either randomly encounter each other while traveling on business trips or going on holidays, or they start writing to each other, perhaps via government and military archives in each other's countries, and they make contact. And around about the 30-year mark, they start making individual visits back to the battlefield and having a look at it all. And at the 40-year mark, that's when they commence having 
tour groups and busloads of themselves go in, in, in package flight deals. And before they all became too bloody old, there were lots and lots of German fighter pilots hosting gatherings of US 8th Air Force bomber crews and fighter pilots back in Germany, in the Ruhr, where during the early 1940s, they were desperately trying to kill each other and they, they bring along their wives and they bring along their kids, they bring along their friends, they introduce each other to the people that they were trying to kill and the people who were trying to kill them and they have dinner dances and they get pissed and they get onto the war stories and they all agree and you know, I mean, I've, I've, I've read this in Air and Space Smithsonian, the particular, you know, 8th Air Force versus the, the Jaguar. They all agree that there's no hard feelings between them as old men because they've lived long enough to figure out that they never ever had any reason to want to kill each other. It's like, I don't know whether it was um, Siegfried Sasson or. Uh, some other English trench poet said at the almost the very end of the First World War, I think it was the first week of October, and uh, he wrote two weeks before he was killed, and he was killed two weeks before the end of the First World War in a, in a night raid. He wrote, should anyone later inquire why we died, tell them it was because our fathers lied. A similar sentiment came out of Eric Maria Remark in All Quiet on the Western Front. He said, don't bother trying to blame my generation who fought the First World War on any side for the war. He said, we were school kids. We knew nothing but to obey. We obeyed our parents. Our minds were shaped by our parents, our teachers, our next door neighbours, our clergymen, our scoutmasters, the people who wrote the newspapers, the editors, the magazine writers. It wasn't our fault that we had been raised and conditioned to join the army, march up and down in neat straight rows, obey orders, go off to the front and try and kill strangers for four years. The American B-52 Super Fortress, the um, Strato Fortress crews, the people who bombed Hanoi during the Christmas bombings in 1972, they went back to Hanoi in a mass tour group and stayed in a motel and they met up with the surface-to-air missile crews who'd been shooting them down. And they had a feature-length article in Air and Space, Smith, Space Smithsonian too. I've nursed Australian veterans of everything from 1914 to 1984 for an average of 10 days each, and I think there are about 2,000 of them. During my last year as a student nurse at Concord, I sat down and worked it out while I was on night duty. Uh, eight patients to a bay, you get one bay on day shift, and two bays on evening shift, and 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 there's three people as against four bays for night shift. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've talked to, to veterans of everything Australia's been in from 1914 to 1984. And all those old veterans all come up with, with the same basic story is that they didn't join up for reasons of, I want to save my nation from the conquering invader. They joined up because everybody else was doing it. They didn't want to look like a coward in the eyes of their parents and their friends and particularly their girlfriends. They thought it was going to be exciting. They were going to get paid to wear fancy uniforms and play around with really expensive government issue toys that they couldn't otherwise afford. Um, and after they'd been trained and when they got into a position of combat, if they did, and not actually all of them did, but when they got into combat, they all felt that what the hell am I doing here reflex kick in. And 
we won't really get too deep into you know the Mitchell report that says only 13% of combat infantrymen fire their weapon the first time in combat. But the reason they stood their ground and did what they were told was not because they were trying to spare their parents or their girlfriend from being invaded and ravished by the wicked evil enemy, the enemy. What they were doing was not letting their mates down not running out or failing the people that they'd been through training with because during basic training they had been traumatically depersonalized and then reprogrammed and regimented and they'd been given a new family and the new family was their combat unit their platoon their company their division their regiment their division they did not want to let their mates down so therefore they went through fucking hell and high water rather than let their mates down. And after 20 or 30 years of waking up screaming at the midnight visitors, the people who got sent overseas because of their belief in paranoid ideation and obedience to constituted authority, yeah, when they're really old, they get together and they get drunk together and they talk about what a crock of shit war is. Because all war is always all bullshit. And my point, speaking as a pacifist, is that it would be a really clever idea if everybody who's in uniform in every armed farce all over the world was to sit down and think about it and decide that because in 25, 30, 40 years' time they're going to realise that this is all a crock of shit, then why don't they put the fucking gun down now and go home and learn to get on with living their life? Now, why have they got to go through firing off as much ammunition as they can get through before somebody stops them. Hmm? They, they're not going to put their gun down because of paranoid ideation. They're not going to think for themselves because of paranoid ideation. Oh, well, if they're going to, then what I'll do is paranoid ideation. It's enough to give diarrhea the shits. So it is. And perhaps the saddest and most fucked up thing about war and military servitude and paranoid ideation is that while the concept of willfully attempting to assault, harm, wound, maim, kill some other person because of a personal fear that that other individual is going to inflict harm or injury on oneself, because of that last word, self, I'm scared for myself, therefore you're frightening and nothing because I'm allowed to pull my gun and not take a step back and I can shoot you because I'm scared. That is an incredibly selfish impulse to give into. And it's still selfish when you're on the battlefield, you know. Selfishness is selfishness. And the only true sin or Satan is selfishness. Put yourself, your own desires or wants or even needs in front of somebody else's needs. In, in the current understanding of survival of the fittest, the fittest doesn't mean the nastiest, the most deadly, the most frightening. The fittest means the most friendly and the most cooperative. Selflessness, giving away your food to somebody else who's hungry because, you know, well, you actually had a meal today and you've got plenty of food at home and they've got nothing, so just share what you've got. Selflessness, that tends to move people toward the light. Selfishness moves people towards the darkness. The problem that I have with warriorism and militarism is that it harnesses the individual's selfless desire to do the right thing by their family, their nation, their chain of command. And if that means they go out and risk dying in a ditch beside a crossroads in some fucking place that nobody's ever heard of before, they will selflessly go out and put themselves in the place of honour they will face whatever danger there is. So you've got this complicated mixture of selflessness 
motivating people to go out and become ultimately selfish. And it's really not until they grow old enough to wake up to themselves and become sick of doing it that they're going to stop for himself because the whole fucking world runs on perfect liberty and with perfect liberty there goes perfect responsibility if you make a decision time doesn't allow you to go back and remake that decision the downstream consequences of that decision unfold through the time stream time stream from the very cusp of that decision you decide to join the military you can't wait until you're in combat and decide you don't want to be there and, and you know, stand up and walk away if the enemy doesn't shoot you your own officers will shoot you because desertion in the face of the enemy yep the penalty is death summarily otherwise everybody might stand up and walk away and go home if your great great grandfather cut down all the trees and switched off the rainfall and then ploughed too many times and over harvested and the erosion kicked in and the salination kicked in they put the topsoil at the bottom of the ocean and now all you've got left left is dirt and rocks then congratulations dickhead you get to grow your food in dirt and rocks because your ancestors the people who shat before you cess means shit successfully suck cess fully Put the topsoil at the bottom of the ocean. That's why you have to learn to grow food on rocks. Perhaps in sand. Hydroponics, maybe. Choice, decisions, actions, they have unfolding, cascading consequences. And perfect liberty means everyone always has absolute freedom to pick wrong and they're still locked into the consequences of it and somebody decided in late 1770s after they'd rebelled against Britain successfully that America had been short on weapons so therefore the American government subsidized sponsored coddled otherwise made life easy for the armaments manufacturing industry and they had a little civil war because everybody had guns. Then the Europeans went across to America and lent the Americans the money to build the armaments manufacturing facilities and issued them contracts at such a high profit rate that within five years the American armaments manufacturers had paid off for loans and they had these lovely gun factories. And the only way for them to continue to expand business was for America to get into the First World War to increase the consumption of munitions produced in America so they have all these laws favoring the firearms manufacturing industry favoring the paranoid ideation of the people who think that the way to make themselves safe is not to have faith in their God theory good Lord their religion can't keep them safe. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. They've got to be ready to shoot down anything they can imagine of which to be afraid. Land of the brave and home of the free where everybody sleeps with a fucking gun because they're afraid of who might sneak up on them. That's not bravery. That's rank fucking cowardice in my book. Paranoid ideation. Back to that one. Paranoid ideation. Probably enough amateur psycho babble analysis for one video. Wobbles on a lot to YouTube. Have a good one. Stay safe. Ciao.